So now we're going to continue to part two of faith that's essential for salvation. Oh man, I don't know how to tell you this. I'm probably going to take in uh, some of your Sunday school time because the points that we're dealing with are pretty big points. So it might be long. Please bear with me. Um, next sermon um, is going to be uh, faith without work. I mean, works. Oh, let's say faith is dead without works. There we go. So we will go over that point too. All right. But I don't want it to get mixed up like, oh, Pastor Abby wants me to work at church so that he knows that I'm sick. Man, that's not what I'm talking about. You know, like, the idea is that, and I'll go ahead and give you the bottom line answer before the sermon even starts. The bottom line idea is that if you truly believe God, your actions are going to show it. That's just all it's saying. It doesn't make sense like, I believe God, and then you don't act like a child of God. That's what, that's what it's basically saying, right? So you already know the answer to it. I'm just going to go ahead and just bang it into your head so that you just, just bang it into your head. So that's what we'll do. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, go into our sermon. Uh, why don't we open up the word of prayer? <laughs> Heavenly Father, you are an awesome God. You are worthy of all our praise. Father God, when we sing songs to you, Lord, when we say that we hear the trees actually giving out their cry to you, Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that we don't just sing that song, that we actually can hear that, Lord. And if we don't hear it, Father God, we're begging you, Lord, to have mercy so that we can hear it, Lord. We want to be able to go outside and say we're blessed. We want to be able to see the sun and say, Lord God, you are shining that sun on me. I am blessed, Lord. So open our eyes, Father. Help us to praise you. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You are glorified. You are deserved. You deserve all you deserve all our praise, Father. Glory and honor, strength and power belong to you, God. Wisdom and strength come from you, God. Who can we turn to, Father? You have the words of life, Lord. Father God, help us to, to glorify you in our prayers, Lord. God, take us to that place, Father. Help us when we write songs, or when we write poems, Father, that we mean what we write, Lord. Father God, you said in your word, in Proverbs, that let not mercy and truth forsake us, Lord. So, Father God, let the mercy of God fall on us, Lord, so that we would know how to share mercy with others. And, Father God, let the truth come to us, Father God, and, and not just this ordinary truth, but the truth of who you are and the truth of who we are, Lord, because we have to face that, Father God. And we have to take the truth of who we are, Lord, and repent from that in Jesus' name. So, Father God, I pray as we talk about salvation today, you somehow change us in your miraculous way. I don't know how you do it. I mean, you do that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, so we're going to go to faith, uh, the essential for salvation, part two. So, uh, as a quick review, it's on. what is faith? Uh, we went to Hebrews 11, verse 1, right? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So we say that faith is the reality or title or the foundation, right? And so what do we get through faith? Uh, the things that we hope for, which are God's eternal promises, God's eternal presence, eternal life, many other promises like daily provision and more stuff. So where does faith come from? Hearing God's word. <coughs> Scripture. So it's plain and simple. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. And why do some hear God's word and yet still have no faith? Because they chose not to believe. Uh, Matthew 13, 14, 15. Oh, you guys see the passages there. Uh, hopefully you, got, you will be able to check them. So then that way you don't just take the, the preacher who happens to be a liar sometimes <laughs> uh, for his word for it that you have to check So faith, essential for salvation, part two. So now we're going to talk about how faith works concerning salvation, or in other words, how faith works to get you saved, or, and then um, how faith works concerning sanctification, 
and how faith works to do with your sins. So that's what we do in those two points. And they're going to be long points. So how faith works concerning your salvation. Let's go, let's go take a passage here. For by grace, which is a gift of God, you have been saved through faith. So faith acts as that gift. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. <clears throat> not of works, lest anyone should boast. So again, in order for you to access the gift of God, there needs to be an avenue, and that avenue is faith. Uh, that's just another translation, but we'll go ahead and read it. God saved you by His grace when you believed. So that's a little bit stronger. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. So it's almost interesting that he says it like that. It's almost as though faith is a gift from God. All right? So let's go ahead and uh, let's have marinate for a bit. <coughs> Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. Amen. So the New Living Translation has an interesting way of saying it. So let's go back to our definition of faith in Hebrews 11.1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So again, what is faith? Faith is the reality, the foundation, the title deed. It's something that's based on fact. It's not make-believe. And what is hope? It's something we know to be true, but we do not see. So let's go back to Hebrews 2.8 and 9, right? We read this passage here, and basically what we're saying is that salvation is God's gift, and it's something that we do not see, but we hope, but we know it's real, right? That's your hope. Salvation is what we hope for. Faith simply makes salvation a reality for you. All right? So, the converse is also true. In other words, if you don't have faith in God's gift of salvation, if you don't believe, if you don't make a choice to believe, then salvation is not a reality for you. All right? So that's the idea. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. Okay? By believing, you have access to that salvation. And salvation becomes real. Man, so I'm, I looked over here and I was amazed because Jake was actually looking at me as though he was actually understanding what I was saying. It's just amazing. But anyway, we go on with some of the illustrations. All right? Let's go and give you a, a hardcore illustration of the scriptures. Um, <clears throat> 12 men went to, okay, so in Numbers 13 through 14, and we focus on these verses here. 12 men went to spy in Canaan. Two had faith, and 10 did not have faith. Do you guys remember that story? Does anyone know that story? Does anyone do not know that story? Raise your hand. Okay, thanks. Thank you for your honesty. I love humility, by the way. Praise God, humble men. Okay, so what ended up happening in that story, just as a quick review, is that God said, "This is going to be the land you will conquer. It's yours." So what they did was they sent twelve men to go check it out, see how it was cool. You know, it was like open house over at the land of Canaan. So they wanted to go look at look at what they had over there. So they looked at the open house, and what they found was like, they found like, I don't know, huge great clusters, man. It's like big as like a watermelon, you know? It's like all these fruitful trees. And then they saw like some really huge giants, like titans, right? And 10 of them were like, yeah, this is a cool home. And man, those guys are pretty big. How are we supposed to conquer that? And then two of them were like, yeah, I know they're big, but God gave this to us. So it's ours, right? So what ended up happening was those 10 men were saying, no, we can't get that land. It's impossible. Or in other words, they didn't have faith. They didn't have faith in what God said. While two other people did have faith. And you know what ended up happening when they didn't have faith? It became a reality for them. They did not go into the promised land. While the two believed that God gave it to them. And guess what happened? They did go into the promised land. Caleb was so old. I think he was about, what, 70 years old? 85 years old. 
and got into the promised land. And the crazy thing about this man, and I don't understand it because it biologically does not make sense, but this 85-year-old man was as strong as a 30-year-old man. And he was still able to make war. How is that even possible? How is that possible? I don't know, but I think all things are possible with God. And if you do believe, somehow he makes a reality for you. And that's what he did with that. So, I'll go ahead and say this, you know, just as a quick review. Those who chose to believe the ten men instead of Joshua and Caleb wandered in the wilderness for 40 years and died there, never experiencing the reality or title being of the promised land because they did not believe. Joshua and Caleb, as well as others who believed, experienced the reality or the title deed of the promised land because they have faith. <coughs> now Joshua and Caleb did not get the promised land right away. The promised land was something they hoped for. But eventually, when God's time was right, they experienced the promised land. Similarly, when God's timing is right, when you put your faith in God's gift for you, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, you will eventually experience the reality of complete salvation. Amen? Amen. All right, so that's basically what it's saying there. <clears throat> now, earlier we said that faith, <coughs> true faith, isn't make-believe. It believes something to be true without any shadow of a doubt. Think of Joshua and Caleb being a hard cold, hard cold example. Faith is a foundation, the reality, the title deed, and many other descriptions we use to picture faith. But now we have to be very specific because the faith you have in believing the existence of gravity is different from believing in God's promises, even though both are true. There's a distinction between those two. Not a huge difference because both are based on truth, but this difference is what makes you a child of God and not just a person who believes in unseen facts. Okay? Now here's the difference of the faith. The object of your faith, in other words, what you put your faith in is what distinguishes you from all others who have factual faith. So let's revisit the definition in Hebrews 11.1. In other words, what you put your faith in is what makes a difference. Okay, for those that are brainiacs, it's the object of your faith. But let me go ahead and just make it specific as I read this verse. Because it makes an assumption here that I need to clarify. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, for the, end of, for the evidence of things not seen. And there's an underlying assumption, which I said earlier, and here's the underlying assumption. Faith in God is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. That's what it is. Because see, you, you gotta, you gotta, I don't know how to put this. The prosperity gospel almost eliminates this idea. They probably talk about it, but they don't really emphasize that you have to put your faith in him. They almost, in a way, they kind of say God and stuff, and they'll trick you and say put your faith in yourself and what you do. And that's the problem with the prosperity gospel. The faith is misplaced. The object of your faith is misplaced. They said, believe in yourself, and you will accomplish. But the, pro but the fact is, with the scripture, it's your faith in God that allows you to be able to accomplish his will, to be able to access um, the promise that God gives you. So it's faith in God, not faith in you, not faith in your ability, faith in him. So that's the big deal. So when we talk about faith, and I hope and pray that this is the assumption now, every time we talk about faith here, it's always faith in God. All right? Not the faith that you have in gravity. Not the faith that when you sit down on that chair, you know it's going to hold you up. That's what I call, you know, natural faith. That's real. But I'm talking about the grandness of all truth. This truth that underlies that faith. And that's faith in God. Just to let you know what was happening with my devotions last night, I was reading Proverbs chapter 3. I just kept reading it until I somehow got a breakthrough. And then later on, um, it said something quite interesting. It said, the Lord, by wisdom, 
um, founded the earth. Uh, by wisdom, he broke up the depths and the clouds dropped down the dew. And I'm like, hold on a bit. He founded the earth and then you established the heavens. That's what it said. And I don't know why I kept staying there. I just kept looking at it. And he said, look, you founded the earth. Lord, hold on. You founded the earth. That's like you actually made a house and put down a foundation. But here's a crazy thing. The earth is hanging on nothing. There's nothing that stands under it. Why is it out there? Why does it do that? And I'm like, man, that's crazy, Lord. How do you do that? So I see the Milky Way galaxy, and I see it all spinning around. And then I imagine sort of like, and I don't know how it is, but you know how sometimes when you're, it's like laying down and you spin it, and then it starts to kind of like rise up and stuff? And if you're on a merry-go-round, I mean, if it's being spinning on a slow speed, you'll stay on it. But as soon as they start spinning it fast, you better hold on tight because you're going to fly off. Have you ever been there before? And so I'm imagining the earth, and it's almost like it's spinning. And God knew exactly how to keep it in place. And I'm like, Lord, that's awesome. How do you do that, Lord? You're like this mighty engineer that I've never known. And then you put all the stars out there. How do you do that? And I'm like, man, I don't know. You made all this for me, God. You actually care about little old me. There's no life out there, but there's life in little old her, and you made all the whole universe. Even the galaxies out there for us. Man, you're a mighty God. You know, I see, I see, you know, almost like new parents when they buy their, their baby a crib, and they buy this, this little crib thing that they hang over the baby, and it plays music and spins around and stuff. And then when it when they turn off the lights, maybe it glows in the dark, you know, and then they kind of like look at that and go to sleep. Well, you know, I think God does that with us too. Every night. When you look at the constellation Orion, when you look at the Big Dipper, when you look at all the stars up there, he says, I love you. And he lets it spin around if you're able to notice that. And I'm like, man, how could I be so dumb for, for all these years in Christianity and not notice how much God loves me when I look up in the sky? But he does. Because every time you're a parent and you do that to your child, God does the same for you. And that's what faith does. You start believing. You start seeing things. And it starts to become real to you. Faith in God's a big deal. And I hope and pray when you go into your devotions, you start to see things that you've never seen. You know, um, earlier, I had the munchies um, last night. And Del Taco has his new one, burrito. It's like, like this chicken burrito. It's like five bucks. So um, it was like 12 o'clock. I was like, man, I want to go eat that thing, right? And I'm like, man, you know what? Like, so I start driving, right? I start driving. I'm down on Spring. And as I'm driving, on the corner of Spring and Orange, on the left-hand side, on the corner, I see a woman in a red sleeping bag sleeping under the light. And this is where you start to hear God's voice, man. It's not, it's not complicated. Don't, don't think, oh, God's going to say, I want you to be like the super pastor. And thank you very much. Look at this guy, man. See, you know God's in him, right? So, you, start, you know God starts, it's not like the super amazing thing where, oh, I want you to like conquer the world through the gospel. And I don't know what that is. I think Satan's in that talk because he's, He's trying to stir up your pride about that. So God starts talking. To him like, You're going to Del Taco, right? That's what he says. God, man, I just want to buy myself a burrito. You know, like, you know, you know exactly what I want you to do. You know. You know. Because of all the mercy I've given you, you know what you're supposed to do. I'm like, Lord. So I go over there, right? And very typical of me, I forget what he says. I buy myself a burrito, right? And I don't buy that person, whoever that person was, anything. Until I realize I got my burrito. I'm like, oh, I forgot to buy that other person something. So I go, it's okay. I'm going to go to McDonald's. I'm going to go get a, go get a McPick 2 or something. Give him that. 
And um, it turns out they didn't have the McPick 2 at the, at the gas station on Cherry and, and Willow. So I was kind of mad, so I went back to Del Taco. <laughs> so I went back to Del Taco and I was like, all right, I'm going to get this person three tacos. I'll get a few tacos. So I got three tacos. So the person was like, oh, yeah, I see you again. You're back. I was like, yeah, I'm back. And I just, I don't know, I saw this person outside and you know, they were sleeping on the floor. I just had to go get them tacos. And then I noticed that the person um, at Del Taco, their like, attitude quickly changed. Like, oh, wow, really? Well, that's cool. And they became even more gracious. You know, like, oh, take more hot sauce or, or do all this stuff, you know? And this is what I mean when you start to become a light to people, all right? That when you start to, man, it's so simple. I can't believe it. It's so simple. All you have to do is just do that. And all of a sudden, people just start changing, and you don't even expect this to happen. You don't plan for this. So then the person in front of me, at the, at the register, is like, yeah, just take this, take this. I'm like, wow, all right. So I took it. So I go and I, I drive back to that place. She's still right there, you know, um, lying down on the floor. And I park, and you got to watch out because those people that are sleeping outside, they are super alert. You think that they're knocked out, they're not knocked out. And there's a purpose for that because somebody can stomp their head and they wouldn't know it. So they always got to be aware. That's why she's sleeping in the light too. So she sees exactly who you are. So I approach slowly and she like, like that, right? And I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. I'm, I was apologetic because I knew that was going to happen. So I, you know, I just wanted to give this to you. And then she was like, oh, okay, thanks. And she went back to sleep and I just put it by her head. And then went back into my car, went back home. But you see, it's those things, man. I'm trying to help you understand what it looks like when you're walking by faith and some, some things start to come around, turn real to you. You start to learn that God loves you, right? When you start to understand that, when you look into creation, you start to see how he loves you. Then you start to say, okay, now I want you to show other people how much I love them. And then he starts giving you these little things. And I'll tell you right now, your flesh doesn't want to do them. That's how you know if something is wrong. Like, you, you know that something's happening to you. Your flesh doesn't want to do it. Because it's so inconvenient to you. You know, you don't want, it, it makes you get out of yourself. You know, like, man, I, I got to waste my gas to do this. Man, this person don't care. Like, what do I get out of this? You know, th those are normally responses of your flesh talking. But if you submit then of course the devil's going to end in the flame. All right. That's exactly what we're talking about. So when you hear the voice of God, please do not think of it as like you're doing something dramatic. It starts with the simple things. And then it starts building up from there. And don't be surprised when you start to see, well, don't be surprised when David becomes king. Because he never imagined himself to be king. That dude was a shepherd boy. That's all he did. All his war experience to fight the lion. You want, you want to look? You know what it looks like? Imagine, imagine David coming in with a resume to King Saul and asking him, "How? You know, like, what are your qualifications to beat Goliath?" Oh, I, I killed a bear, killed a lion, killed a wolf. That's what I did. Wait, have you ever swung a sword before? No. You put on armor before? No. I used a slick shot. Man, he ain't qualified to go fight this big old dude. This guy ain't no lion or bear, man. You don't understand. God qualified me, and if he can save me in those things, he can save me from this guy. His faith was not in his ability. Understand this. His faith was in God. He killed Goliath. Then God anointed him as king. Did David believe he was king? When God anointed him to be king, did David believe he might have seemed like he didn't, you're right. But I believe that in some way he did, but it just wasn't his right time. He hoped to be king one day, because he believed. And so he ran away from King Saul. The, the rightful king of Israel was not sitting on his throne. He was running away, running away all the time, hiding in caves, actually trying to serve the king, not trying to kill him, because that was the Lord's anointing. 
And then one day it became realized, right? And then he finally became king. So I want you to understand this thing about faith. It, it doesn't give you instant gratification, okay? It's something that you know to be true, and you don't let it go even if you don't see it. And you, can, and you keep believing in it because you know God has given it to you already, and you don't stop, all right? So anyway, um, I know I blew up this idea of a God, but I hope you got something from that. Faith in God is a big deal. Don't just talk about just regular faith. Faith in God, okay? So if I keep repeating it, please don't get annoyed by me. Faith in God. Faith in God. By faith in God, the things that you don't see, that you hope for, will become reality. So faith in God is the foundation, the reality, the title of the promises of God. So don't get this all mixed up with your faith in the chair you sit in, or the faith in your car, in your, in, or, or the faith your car will turn on when you turn the ignition. Those things are similar to true faith, but they are not true faith. Faith in God is what makes all the difference. Faith in God is such a big deal that Hebrews puts it this way, but without faith in God, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So if you didn't catch it in here, he tells you right here. Right? That you must believe that he is. That's faith. Alright. So, just so that you can see the reality. Remember I said that if you don't believe something to be true, then that will not be a reality for you? So, our ancestors actually learned that the hard way. Okay? Don't ever think that you cannot be like the ten spies in Canaan, because actually you can be. That's why they wrote it this way, as a warning for us. It says, and this is what happened when they did not believe in God. Then the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people reject me, and how long will they not believe me? He hates that. He hates that so much. And you want to see the judgment after that? When they said that they did, they did not believe me? And with all the signs which I performed among them, they still don't believe me? And this is a, a person who is hurt, by the way. Who is hurt because they did not put his faith, they did not put their faith in him. I will strike them with the pestilence and disinherit and dis them. And I will make of you a nation greater and mightier, mightier than they. And so he was about to do that to all of those people. Then Moses intercedes. He says, no, God, that's not like you. You don't do that, God. I know you. You don't do that. You know, what are people going to say? You know, you took them out of the land of Egypt so that you can kill them in the wilderness, God? That's not you because you got our mercy. You're a merciful God. So you know what God says? Eh, you're right. You got it, Moses. I just wanted you to react that way so we can write it in the Bible so that everybody, everybody can read it and know how this is <laughs> But I know you know. I just need you to say it. Right? Sometimes it's kind of weird how women are too, right? They know that you love them, but sometimes they just make you to say it. So, maybe in a way. <laughs> so maybe in a way, you know, I don't know. But anyway. So then God says, I'm not going to do that anymore. But he has to be a just God. Right? He, he, he will give mercy upon others. Right? Abundant mercy but then he will not acquit the guilty. Right? Isn't that what he said? So then that's why he falls up with this. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. But, right? But, oh no. But truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all these men who have seen my glory and the sign which I did in the wilderness, that's scary, okay? That's scary. And I put me to the test now these ten times, Interesting. Didn't he put Pharaoh to the test ten times? And now he puts them to the test ten times. But the problem is, they rejected him, and it's bad. It's almost like you expect Pharaoh to do that, but not you guys. Because he did it to punish him, but he did it to bless you, and you still reject him. Oh, man, that's scary. Does the fear of the Lord kind of trip you up from here? That's a concept that has to be implemented right now. I have to repeat that there. So the fear of the Lord starts to come out. And I'm not heeding my voice. 
they certainly shall not see the land which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those rejected. So they made this bronze serpent that if you look at that serpent, even if you were bitten by a snake, you will be saved. All right? So that's sort of like a little example. Now he's going to give you the major truth. And he says, look to me and be saved. All the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. So true salvation comes from God. Man, type You cannot experience true salvation if we do not put our faith in him. And so in the New Testament, Jesus says it this way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me or through faith. And I am God. That's basically what he's saying. And this, he says, and this is the will of him who sent me, John 6, 40, that everyone who sees the Son, look to me and be saved. He who sees the Son and believes in him, puts his faith in him, Jesus or God, may have everlasting life and that will raise him up at the last day. So Jesus now starts to kind of like bring up the truth. God says in Isaiah, look to me and be saved. Jesus specifically says, Whoever sees the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life. And here's the greatest thing about our generation. Because they were lucky. And it's really scary because a lot of them got to saw, get the, got to see what He did. And maybe ten times they saw it and they still didn't believe. And guess what you think? It, guess where they ended up? But we who never seen God in our life, and yet somehow we do see, and we do believe, you are blessed beyond measure. I don't even know how to say it, but you are blessed. So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, faith, the object of your faith is a big deal, and you will be saved, you and your household. And here, we're going to kind of like use a verse to tie up everything. But the scripture, because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, has to find all under sin that the promise, hope of salvation, or hope of the things that you look for, by faith in Jesus Christ, might be give, given give to those who believe. So it's almost like that verse catches everything of what we were just talking about um, these past two Sundays. Now, here's our conclusion for how faith works concerning salvation. So to have the reality of salvation in your life, all that's necessary is that you believe God gives it to you through Jesus Christ. You believe Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose from the dead on the third day, and by believing, you have the hope of eternal life with God. Faith in God makes His promises reality for you. This is your foundation. This is how you stand. This is how you know you are saved. As, as a review, I'm assuming that we have repented first and then put our faith in the gospel. This issue is crucial. Recall these verses said by John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and said, Repent, for the kingdom of God, is, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus even says exactly the same thing as John the Baptist. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now that's interesting, right? Because Jesus said to the Pharisees, if you would know my father's doctrine, you would know me. Right? Well, guess out of one of those people in the, in the New Testament who happens to be supposedly uh, of a high line. I think he was from, uh, he comes from a priestly line, right? He was a priest in Luke, and he was lighting up incense that John the Baptist got. He's a big deal, isn't he? Because he comes from a priestly line, right? Didn't he know God's doctrine? Oh, yes, he did. Because when he saw the, when he saw Jesus, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And he says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So it, it's only natural that Jesus is going to say the same thing because John the Baptist knew the doctrine of what the Old Testament was saying. And he was saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So that's doctrine there. Then now, in Mark, now after John was put in prison, 
Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel and I believe it has to be in that order. Maybe that's an opinion of mine, but when I look at scripture that way, it just makes sense. Repent first, turn from your wicked ways, put your faith in Christ Jesus. So when I say you put your faith in God, there's another underlying assumption there. And that underlying assumption is you've repented. Okay? Repentance is a big deal. There, there's no such thing as faith in God and no repentance. Okay? So repentance must be there. Okay, now we go to the topic of sanctification. So remember I told you this is going to be long? Sorry, all right? You got why don't, we, why don't we pray first as, a, as like an intermission, right? <laughs> we'll pray for intermission because, man, it gets tiring. So, uh, yeah, honestly, let me give you some time to pray to the Lord right now. Pray to the Lord. This is your intermission right now. <clears throat> so now we're going to the point of how faith works concerning sanctification. And how faith works to deal with your sins. <clears throat> Um, that's basically what we're going to be talking about. Now, the faith that deals with sanctification is exactly the same as the faith that deals with your salvation. You believe God's promise of eternal life in Jesus Christ. Now you believe God's promise for your holy life through the Spirit of Christ. Okay? Or the Holy Spirit. So the same. Just as you believe in John 3.16 for salvation, now you believe all the other Bible verses that deal with your sanctification. I believe the majority of believers have no problem believing in John 3.16, but the same majority also have problems believing the other Bible verses dealing with their sanctification. So let's pray right now that for 2018, we will believe the Bible verses that deal with our personal sins. To begin our journey, we need to keep in mind how we deal with personal sins. And number one, is the Spirit of Christ, all right, or the Holy Spirit. We have no power to deal with our sins. So we're going into the topic again of sanctification. How, do we, how does faith deal with our sanctification? One of the things about your faith, you have to add to this, all right, not add to it, but one of the necessary requirements is that the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, must be involved. Just as Jesus Christ was involved in your salvation, the Holy Spirit will be involved in your sanctification. Okay, so the bottom line is God is involved in the process. <coughs> so John 16, 13, however, when he, the spirit of truth, the spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. For all truth in scripture is that revelation of who God is, and also conviction of who you are. So the Holy Spirit will guide you to all the truth. He'll tell you who you are and who God is. And then also Scripture. That's another number two element. So you have the Holy Spirit and then you have Scripture. Again, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Faith comes when you hear God's Word. So Scripture also has a convicting power that crucifies your flesh. So the Holy Spirit's going to be in this process, right? And it's almost like you can't see him. And if you want it to become almost like a reality to you, the Holy Spirit, you open the scriptures. And the Holy Spirit becomes a reality. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's like the title. <laughs> so 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Reproof the Bible by the NLT says, make us realize what is wrong in our lives. He will guide you into all truth. Correction defined by the New Living Translation says, correct us when we are wrong. He will guide us to all truth. Righteousness defined by the New, uh, by the New Living Translation says, do what is right. The Holy Spirit will guide us to all truth. <laughs> so if you want to simplify it, John 3.16, your salvation verse. In Sanctification verses 2 Timothy 3.16. I think God did that on purpose. Amen. So you know for yourself where you have to get sanctified. So when you read it, you're like, okay, God is going to correct me. 
everyday prescriptions. So how faith works concerning salvation? The Spirit of Christ, or God is involved. Scripture, God breathed. And here is where the faith comes into play. And that faith has to be, I believe, combined with these ideas. When you start to read the Scriptures, certain things have to come into your heart when it happens. Alright? So I believe one of the things that happens, and this is my theory on it, okay? You guys have experienced God in different ways. Remember, I'm just... I'm just a, a poor preacher trying to figure this out too. I'm just like everybody else here. But I believe that when you start to read scriptures and have faith in the scriptures, I believe two things need to happen to you. Something has to happen in your heart. One is the fear of the Lord and that repentance needs to come. And that repentance is done through the cross. So here's the fear of the Lord. This is what I mean. The Lord passed in front of Moses calling out, Yahweh, the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy, I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love to, to a thousand generations, and I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin. And I love this part. This is where I experience God is love. I love God. You know, God loves me. That's one side. Then the other side, I believe, is a fear of the Lord. But I do not excuse the guilty. No, I don't. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children and grandchildren. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations. Now, if you don't get that fear in you, that's weird to me. That's my opinion. But if something hits you like that, it's like, whoa. You're telling me that when I sin, it's just not about me, that I can affect others when I sin? Yeah. Guess what happened with Achan? He thought it was just his own personal sin. His whole family got killed. And not only that, other men who didn't make the same sin as Achan, when they tried to conquer their land, they ended up dying. So people get affected when you sin. This is why I'm talking about the fear of the Lord. It should convict us. So, well, no matter where you go, even when I'm not looking, the fear of the Lord is almost like your guy. You understand? So Nahum 1, verse 3. The Lord is slow to get angry, but His power is great, and He never lets the guilty go unpunished. He displays His power in the whirlwind and the storm, the billowing clouds of the dust beneath His feet. So if you don't understand the fear of the Lord in a, in a, in a relational sort of way, He starts giving you pictures of what the fear of the Lord says. And I'm telling you, if I see a whirlwind and a storm and I'm in the middle of the ocean, I get scared. I think I'm not normal if I'm not scared, you know? So I get scared. And then he says, the billowing clouds are dust beneath his feet. And it almost reminds me of a tornado. I'm like, yo, that's a whirlwind tornado. No, man, that's scary, man. I'm out of here. I'm getting out of here. So he starts to give you these descriptions. So the fear of the Lord's a big deal. I believe it is. And I hope and pray that it also becomes a big deal to you. Because it will guide you to that Jesus. So now, here's more of the fear of the Lord. This is hard. This is medicine. But it's good for us. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor sodomites, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And one of the things that got me, nor covetous. Do we practice covetousness? Because if you do, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Don't trick yourself right now. You've got to be honest with yourself. The scriptures say it that plainly. And I believe that when he wrote this, he wrote it to the Corinthians that were a bunch of believers too. So the fear of the Lord must be touching our hearts here. You may think that he even stops right there, but he keeps on going. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And you know what got to me? This got to me. Fits of anger. 
People with fits of anger will not inherit the kingdom of God. And I'm not going to go ahead and shy away from that. If the fear of God is in me, I'm like, yo, stop. Wait a minute. Am I blasting too much? It says in Scripture I'm not supposed to be blasting like that. Because people like that don't inherit the kingdom of God. I believe Scripture. And when God says something like that, I believe it to be true. And the fear of God starts to stir in me. I'm like, man, I better stop that. God, I'm angry too many times. Lord, please help me repent. I, I can't, I don't know why I get angry like this. God, I repent. You know, the fear of God should be in us, if you understand what I'm saying. All right? I'm, yeah, this is a straight up truth. I can't, I can't shy away from this. I can't go ahead and tell you, oh no, you know, God's going to cover your sins and stuff. I can't twist that statement. You understand? So, the fear of God comes in, repentance then follows. We need to be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who, or who is covetous, that is an idolatry. He actually calls people who are covetous idolatry. Has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Now that should scare me. It should. I can't read that and say, oh, that's cool, and then I'm going to go ahead and read another verse. You know, when I read things like this, it should scare me. It should be like, okay, God, all right. Lord, I stop. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way of everlasting. If you guys know what that passage is, that's in Psalms 139. And I believe that's a, that's a prayer of repentance. You're asking God to show, to show you where, where you need to repent from. So these passages are to instill the fear of God in us. To let us know. I'm not talking about losing salvation here. Okay? Don't get it all mixed up. But I'm talking about you being truthful to the Lord. Because bottom line is, only you really know if you're really saved. And if you are practicing such things, best be known, God says, you do not inherit the kingdom of God. And he says it like that. And there's no way around it. There's, there's no way to, oh, pastor, am I really saved? And, you know, start talking. He's like, oh, yeah. Did you, did you do John 3, 16? Yeah. Did you put your faith? Yeah. Then you're saved. Don't worry about that. No. It's, it, it's not going to work. The scriptures is where your faith comes from. And it has convicting power. It, it's described as being a sword that divides the, the soul and marrow. It does that stuff to you. And if, if you want to share, if you want to work out your salvation, you got to come to the scriptures and allow the Holy Spirit to do that for you. Because there's no other way. I can't, I can't assure you of your salvation. You know, almost my first instinct, and I don't know because that's my habit, is that if you're hurting, even if, I'm not, if I know you're being messed up, my first instinct is to comfort you. It's like you're coming with me with like a cut off cut off leg and you're bleeding to death and I just stick you up with morphine so that you make you, make you feel good. Because, because I don't want you to feel bad. You know? It's all, that's, my, that's my evil tendency. I don't want to be like that. So you know what I do? God, I can't do that. I, I don't know how to be like that. So God, you do it. You convict them. You, you, put, you give the scriptures, God, because I, I can't do that. And I believe the Lord has power to do that. Amen. There was a, a post that Kuya Job um, kind of remembered that I posted back last year. I didn't even remember that I wrote that. And it happened when a guy, I think he was a new Christian, he went to a concert with a bunch of other Christians. And this guy, I don't know what he was doing, he got drunk. He started drinking in front of them. And then all the other Christian guys were like, hey man, we should talk to him. We should say something to him. And the leader... John Vanderstel, I think he's Calvinist too. John Vanderstel, you know what he said? He says, don't say anything to him. Don't. Don't say anything. I want you to pray. Man, pray? We don't pray that God's going to go convict him? That's crazy, man. God uses us to convict him. Just pray. Just pray. All right, man. Just like Peter, when he throws his other side at the other side of the net. If that's what you want, I'll do it. So he so he prays for him. And this is the crazy part. He comes back, right? 
and I guess it was an event, and there was like wine that was there, and he wasn't wanting to drink the wine. They were like, well, hey, why aren't you drinking wine? He was like, no, man, I'm not doing that, man. Uh, I don't know. It's like, I can't do that. Like, God spoke to me, and he said I'm not supposed to be doing stuff like that. And the guy was like, what? Are you kidding? He was flabbergasted that actually God was actually going to do what he was going to do. You know? He's like, yeah, oh, yeah, God actually needed you to say that? He doesn't need anybody. And so that built faith for that person, and the Holy Spirit was able to convict him. So I'm just giving you these verses, and I'm saying that as I'm giving you these verses, I'm allowing the Holy Spirit to come in for the sanctification process, to convict you of those areas. And when you are convicted of those areas, then what naturally follows, I believe, is that you have a natural fear of God, and then you repent. So here, we go ahead and use faith. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, what, and this is when he believed God's word, right? I'm going to destroy this earth. I'm going to let it rain for 40 days and 40 nights, right? So the fear of the Lord should be instilled in us. Move with godly fear, and I believe that's an act of repentance, prepared an ark for the saving of his household. But when she condemned the world, it became the heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. Once God has spoken to you about your sin through his word, and you believe what he says, the next step is to fear what he says and respond with action, which is repentance. So here is how it looks like to repent. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. So he wants us to put that to death. But how do we put it to death? But now you yourselves are to put off all these, all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds. Okay, you want me to put it, put it to death? You want me to put it off? How do I do that? says it again, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Okay, Lord, you're telling me to put it to death. You're telling me to put it off. How do I do that? How do I put that to death? For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So you allow the Spirit of God to put it to death. So you come to God and you say, Lord, this is wicked before you. Lord, Lord, kill it, Lord, because I can't kill it. I, 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 like, I like doing it, Lord. I'm addicted to it. I, I'm addicted to being angry. I'm addicted to covetousness. I'm addicted to sexual immorality. I'm addicted to thievery. I'm addicted to this stuff, Lord. Lord, I, I, put it to death, God. Put it to death because I can't do it. And you know how he puts it to death? I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. In other words, he crucifies your flesh. He puts it into that process. He starts killing it through the cross. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. So he starts to slay that thing. He starts to nail it, right? He starts to, like, die. And, this, and, and your flesh is starting to, no, I'm not going to die. I'm going to keep fighting. I'm going to keep fighting. But the Spirit, you, see, you keep on asking the Spirit you know, for, for power, right? And he continues to crucify that thing. And you know that it dies when it stops talking to you. You don't feel it anymore. That's why it's very important that you go by your faith and not your feelings. Because your feelings is, uh, this is what I believe to be true that I got from Kentucky. I believe 
I don't believe it's from Scripture. I, it has scriptural principles, but I don't think it's something that you should put your full faith on. This is it's more like a subjective thing for you. If it works for you, great. If not, then, then let the Spirit of God talk to you. But this is what works for me. I believe that my feelings are a reaction to what my flesh is trying to get me to do. My, my feelings deceive me a lot. That's my experience from my life. And so I have to learn not to listen to my feelings and just listen to what my faith says and what this says. So I shut out what it says. I'm like, no, okay, you say you're hungry, you're not hungry. For faith, you know, for man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You're not hungry, so stop. Stop, you know. And when I say hungry, I'm talking about metaphorically hungry for sin. You think you want that, but you don't. So stop. Okay? I have to talk like that sometimes. So anyway, that's what's happening. All right? That's what's happening. Your, your flesh is being crucified. And those who are, are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desire. So the Spirit of God is crucifying these things. It's nailing it. And it's crying out. Right? It's crying out. Right? So you have a choice to, 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 how do I put this? You have a choice to decide what you want to do here. Either listen to your feelings or you listen to your faith. And I believe that once you listen to your faith, the feelings start to, the voice of feelings start to dwindle a little bit and then it kind of dies off. If then you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth, for you die, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Oh, no, let's put it say. Okay, so I have to make my point here. So this is what I mean by allowing the Spirit of God to crucify your flesh. And I said, you don't listen to how you feel, you listen to what Scripture said, right? So let me go with this first verse here. Okay, so this is how it works. <clears throat> so you're being crucified, right? Now remember how you put your faith in Scripture? How you said, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son? You put your faith in it, right? And after that you didn't worry about it anymore? That's how you got saved? It's the same thing with sanctification. It's exactly the same thing. He says that the body of sin might be done away with, and you should no longer be a slave of sin. So you have to go, you have to talk to you, you got, you got to let your faith voice talk. No, I'm not going to do that, because I am not a slave of sin anymore. I died with Christ. So that means I'm not, I'm not a slave of sin. I don't, I don't like that. That doesn't shame me anymore. I'm not a slave of sin. Okay, that covetousness stuff, that's sin, but I'm not a slave to that. That shouldn't rule me. I know my feelings tell me that it does, but my faith says that I'm not. So I believe it, and it's true. I'm no longer a slave of sin. And so the feeling voice says to me, yes, you are. Yes. <laughs> and it stops. Right? Here's another one. It says, you die, and your life is hidden with Christ. So this is the way it works. I'm already dead. I don't like that stuff anymore. Remember in my old life, I used to do that stuff? Yeah, I used to like going to the disco. Yeah, I used to like going all that stuff. Yeah, I used to like to watch that on TV when I was without Christ. Yeah, I like that stuff. And right now my flesh says it still likes that stuff. But guess what, flesh? You're dead. You died because when Christ died, I was crucified with him. And guess what happened? Now I set my mind on things above, not the things of the earth. So all this stuff on the earth, I don't look at that stuff anymore. I still look at stuff in heaven now. I set my, my treasures up in heaven now. That's what I believe. I listen to my faith now. I don't listen to your, my feelings. Therefore you were buried with him from baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. I'm walking in new life right now. I died with Christ. When I, I was baptized on such and such a day. Because I was baptized on such and such a day, I live a new life. I don't do the old things anymore. 
yeah, that used to be fun, and maybe sometimes my feeling says I do want to smoke one. But I don't do that anymore because I believe I walk in units of life. All right, hold on. Okay, that's it. I'm going to go ahead and stop all this stuff. Uh, you can go ahead and read all the other verses, but I'm going to go ahead and stop and put it here. I want to be merciful. <laughs> Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, dead to yourself, but alive in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. All the bad stuff that got, all the bad stuff that does not inherit the kingdom of God, that all has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I walk in newness of life. And that's what it looks like when you look at this verse. Right? All that bad stuff, that's done. You're dead to that. That's how it looks like to put it to death. Just as the way you believed in salvation, you have to believe these verses too. You say, look, it says I'm crucified to that. I'm dead to that. Now the Spirit of God is activated. It's allowing you to believe the Scriptures. Right? It's like, no, I don't do that anymore. No. I'm dead to that. That's simply what faith does to be sanctified. So, um, I hope you guys got the point. I might have been confusing at the end, but I hope you guys understand that basically what I'm trying to say is I need you guys to believe what the scripture says about you. Amen. And it says that you're dead to that. <clears throat> and it says that you're dead to that, you need to believe it. Just as you put your faith in Christ Jesus for eternal life, you need to believe that the fits of anger, all these things do not inherit the kingdom of God, you need to believe that you're dead to that. You need to believe that. And then you will walk in newness of life. You will walk as a new creation in Christ Jesus. And what you're going to find out too, as this verse here, it's going to be like an ongoing thing as well. Because His mercies are new every morning, and so you're going to be changing, and you're actually going to be new and new each time. Like, you're going to be this one new form. I don't know how else to put it. I'll put it in Dragon Ball Z terms. So, you... You advance, and you go into Super Saiyan 1. And then, later on, you go to Super Saiyan 2. Then after that's not there, you go to Super Saiyan 3. And I know you stop at Super Saiyan 3, but then there's still more, and there's still more, and there's still more to go. So you're, you're always going to be a new creation in Christ Jesus. You don't just stop at this other level of Super Saiyan. There's like Super Saiyan Infinity, if you want to think of it that way. But you just keep going new and new. As the scriptures start to sanctify you, Purify, make you holy for God. We start going to different heights. Mm -hmm. Alright, so let's conclude the matter. So to receive salvation and walk in sanctification, all we have to do is to believe what God says in His Word. I know it's crazy, but it's that simple. And if God's Word isn't working in our lives, we can't conclude that God failed in His promise. We fail to believe what He said. Mm -hmm. and so that being said, thank you for your attention. Um, let's go ahead and pray.